So um, just let me introduce myself. My name is Lindsay Graff. Um, I'm a local practicing architect. I work at University at Buffalo in the planning department. Um, that's my kind of nine to five. But then I'm also um, the vice president of the Buffalo Architecture Foundation, which is a local not-for-profit that's charged with you know, teaching anybody and everybody about architecture. And specifically what I do with the foundation is that I head up the architecture and education program, which is a K through 12 component. Um, our program has been around for about 10 years. Um, the program actually existed before the foundation. Um, we started the program only working in Buffalo Public Schools. It's an every other year program. About 600 kids go through it every other year. Um, Basically, we get uh, local practicing architects to volunteer their time, go into the classrooms 10 times. They um, create this awesome uh, lesson plan in conjunction with the teacher, and it's always about what they're learning in the classroom already, so it's just an extension or a different way of teaching it. And um, after 10 weeks, they have models and drawings and beautiful creations, and we put them up in the SEPA gallery, and it's a really cool event, and we invite all the kids down, and it's a great day. So in addition to that, we've started to, because we're able to get um, more and more funding each year, um, we're actually able to start offering programs that are more public. So we're doing um, family workshops at the WASH Project and um, Sullivan Grider Community Center. So we did them last year, we're going to be doing them this year again in the fall. Um, we're also working with charter schools that we never worked with before, just because charter schools and public schools don't always play nice. Um, and then, actually, in the spring, we're going to be doing a project with Lakeshore High, uh, not High School, Lakeshore Middle School and Elementary School, um, working with the Native American population. So, part of um, my uh, cause, I guess, is that um, I'm really interested in um, diversifying the profession of architecture. It's very much known as an old boys club. Um, and Barrett can speak to that. Barrett's father is an architect who is an old white guy, like I like most of them are. So um, Native Americans actually are the lowest represented population in the profession of architecture. Less than 1% of architects are Native Americans. So it's like there's like five in the whole nation. So because of our geographical location near many, many Native American communities, we have an opportunity to really go into um, these communities and just talk to them about it. Even if they don't want to be an architect, it's just good to get them, uh, get them talking about it. So that's a little background on me and what I do. So, um, all right. So, obviously, uh, to me, teaching architecture is so important. And it's not just important because of diversity, and it's not just important because of education, and we'll talk about the education, but it's important for um, our city at a city scale. So, in Buffalo, we've had um, a past of maybe not appreciating all the buildings that we have, um, and demolishing them, and then looking back and saying, hmm, we probably shouldn't have done that. So how do we start to avoid that? So there's a group in Buffalo called the Buffalo Young Preservationists. It's um, you know kind of emerging professionals or college level students. But I like to think that we need a group below that called the Buffalo Youngest Preservationists, and those are the kids that we're reaching out through to, so K through 12. They're the ones that are going to be in charge of our city. They're gonna be making the decisions on what buildings that we need to keep. So we need to start thinking about how we tell them now, hey, in 30 years, don't you know don't destroy this building it's very important this is why it's important so it you know promotes stewardship and ownership of their city um, it's definitely a knowledge between good design and not so good design so I think in the city of Buffalo we're kind of turning the edge on you know starting to think about our new buildings being really beautiful buildings and well-designed buildings but I would say if you just go one ring outside of our city we have um, a region of very terrible design. So we have a lot of strip malls and just you know endless parking lots and things that really aren't um, you know good design per se. Um, and then how architecture in the built environment shapes our culture. So you know ever since there's been architecture, it's always shaped our culture. If we ever think of the pyramids, we automatically know where they are, what culture they came from. The pyramids had something to do with their culture, um, and that's basically a building. So. In, in any culture, any community, the buildings um, and the functions that happen within the buildings are always, always a definition of what, um, what that culture is. All right, so, oops, sorry. so in addition, um, architecture is multidisciplinary. So this is when we get into the education part. So all of that city scale stuff is really good. But in addition, we can also teach science, math, technology, history, ELA, fine art, anything. 
There's a joke that I have, um, I went to UB for architecture school, and the joke that we had was we went to architecture school, but we learned everything about anything else not architecture, because when you do a project, so we did a project that was a winery, well, yeah, of course, you need to know how to, you know, put together the building and the drawings have to reflect that. However, we got to know a lot about wineries and how they made wine and um, the process and where things need to be within the building. Um, we got to drink a lot of wine during that semester, so it was very good. But we didn't necessarily learn, you know, a different architectural technique during that semester, but we did learn about the program that was going inside the building. So basically, you can teach anything with architecture. I really haven't found a lot of things that you can teach. In addition to that, we have all these soft skills, I like to call them, that are really important that we're teaching our students as well. So problem solving is huge in architecture. Communication is huge. You have to be able to explain to a client who's paying you what your building is going to look, or what their building is going to look like. And you also have to be able to work in a team. It's definitely a team sport. So collaboration is a huge one. Creativity, observation, expression, and then logic. We have to make the building stand. So if we put all this together, it's architecture. So it's city scale, it's education, it's diversity, it's you know anything that you want it to be, which is awesome because you know people like me who like to go into schools, we can literally fit in anywhere. All right. So today, oh, sorry. So today we're going to be um, building the geodesic dome, which um, I'm going to explain a little bit in a second. So um, if we just take this, um, you know this. This rectangle and we look at all the different um, facets when we think of you know when I meet with a teacher and say what are you teaching in school and she says oh we're you know we're really having a hard time with our science unit can you help out with that so we immediately only stick to science okay perfect what else okay well part of our science unit is that we want to you know work on technology perfect and so you start to think of these um, these subject areas and in my mind I'm thinking okay there's got to be a lesson plan that can fit all of that um, in addition you know anytime you're talking about science it's always problem-solving logic anytime you're talking about technology it's you know logic even creativity because we're always trying to create something with technology and always 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 into the in the design process and in the scientific inquiry process there's always a facet of history even if you might not think of it um, I'm, I'm going to talk about now because the design process and scientific inquiry, they're basically the same, which is really awesome when we try to tell people, hey, you know STEM, it should really be STEAM because that A, which is stands for arts, or I like to say architecture, it follows the same exact rules. It's just a different way of thinking about it. It's just a different, pro it's just a different product in the end. So, for the design process, and this is not only architecture, but I'm going to relate it to architecture. Um, so on the on your right hand side. So the first thing is always define the problem. So actually, uh, the architect doesn't define the problem; the client does. The client says, "Hey, I need a building." It's perfect. All right. Um, so the client needs an architect. Great. They hire the architect. The first thing the architect does is talks to the client a little bit about what they want, but even before that. They're going to draw the existing conditions of the building, which is basically they're going to go out and say, oh, you know, if it's a building that we're renovating, we have to know what's already there. If the building is not already there, there's a piece of ground that it will sit on. We have to analyze that. So we're always collecting the information. The next thing we do is we bring it back. You know, we've talked to the client about what their needs are. And so we start to brainstorm and analyze ideas. And this is when we complete preliminary preliminary design, so this is sketches, models, basically all of the ideas that we have. And at this point, nothing is, you know, we don't say no to anything at that point. And the next thing we do is develop and test solutions. So this is when we go into design development. And design development is when we take a couple of those millions of sketches that we did and things that really stick out to us as things that could work, we start to push it a little further. Maybe we push it, you know, 2% further and we say, oh, no, 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 that can't happen. Maybe we push it 10% further and say, okay, maybe, keep pushing it, keep pushing it. Eventually, one or two will make it all the way through. And that's when you typically go back to your client and say, okay, these are a couple ideas that I had. They're not just sketches, they're actual drawings or models that look like what the building will look like at that point. Usually the client will say, I don't know what you were thinking, or change their mind. <laughs> and so you'll have to go back after presenting back to that brainstorming and ideas 
you know, think of a couple other things, go back and test the solutions or design development, and that process goes on and on and on. It takes a really long time to build a building, a really long time, um, because it's expensive. When you make that decision and, you know, you start digging into the ground, that's it. Um, so that is the design process. Now, if we look at scientific inquiry, it's literally the same. So the first thing you do is ask a question. So I'm going to apply what we're doing today to the scientific inquiry. So the first question is, how can I create a lightweight dome? So I know this might not sound like a pressing issue for any of us today at this conference, but it was a very pressing issue for this man named Buckminster Fuller, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So the first thing you have to do is conduct background research. So this is where that history portion comes into play. So you always have to kind of see what people have done in the past. There's always going to be different studies or different experiments that um, groups have already done. So you just study them to know what pieces and parts that you need to take forward for yours or what pieces and parts you can leave behind. So in architecture or design, we call these precedent studies. A precedent study is if you are going to, if you have a client that needs a hospital, you are not going to, from scratch, think about how medical design is needed, right? You, people have done this for many, many years. There's research, there's, you know, once the buildings are built, people write um, articles about how they're working. You use all of that information so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, that's a huge thing in architecture school. You're basically just learning those precedents. So there's medical, there's um, higher education, there's you know, K through 12 education, there's lots of different um, groups that we work in. So for this example, um, for the lightweight dome, we would number one, look at how domes have been constructed in the past, and then number two, um, lightweight construction techniques. So the third is construct a hypothesis. So our, our, our hypothesis, after we've done our background research, so I'm going to skip ahead a little, is that we know that a triangle is really strong, very light. That's perfect. So can we make a triangle into like a sphere-shaped um, form? So at that point, in which we're going to do this today, we're going to complete study models. So we're going to actually be building some geodesic domes out of um, toothpicks and marshmallows, and then we're going to be building them full scale in the back too. And we're going to communicate the results. So did it work? Well, I know that this one works because I built it already. But guess what? I've never actually built the full scale one. So we're literally going to be doing the experiment today, which is good. And so we'll talk about why it worked, why it didn't work. And then if we, you know, if we have time or if we have the resources, we can go back and make adjustments to the hypothesis if we need to, to really get it to, to work out for us. So in order to do this, we have to talk about structures. And structures is basically how a building stands. So um, this is when everybody says, oh, I always wanted to be an architect, except I'm really bad at math, which everybody says that to me on a daily basis almost. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my really quick lesson on how you actually don't need to be good at math. You just need common sense, because all of this has numbers applied to it. But if you know these basic things, you don't. it doesn't matter. <laughs> The numbers are the numbers. All right, so the first thing, and we all know this, gravity wants everything to be pulled down to the center of the Earth. Obviously, the ground is in the way of the center of the Earth, so we're going to just call it the ground. Obviously, everything wants to follow the ground. So that's a problem for us when we're starting to build buildings and putting people on them, because really, it's, um, it's anti-gravity. It definitely doesn't want to be standing. So we have to think of ways to get it to, to be standing and against gravity. Plus a lot of movement in the building, so it's definitely complicated. Okay, so in buildings, um, we talk about loads. So loads are what is what we think of as wanting to go down to the ground. So there are two types of loads: dead loads, which are just the building itself. So if you just built a building and you never put anything or anyone in it, and it never snowed or anything, that would just be the dead load. But we know that that's not true. People will inhabit the building. There'll be furniture. There'll be equipment. A lot of times it's very heavy. There'll be snow on the building. And those are called live loads. And we have to make sure that we can accommodate all of those against gravity. OK, so this is going to be our symbol for a load. And um, basically, that means you're just going to take your finger and push down on something. So we're going to start to build. And this is all going to make sense, I promise. <laughs> all right. so. 
The first thing we're going to do, and you have toothpicks and marshmallows in front of you, is we're going to build a square. So the square should look like this. Okay, so you should have four sticks and four marshmallows. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I couldn't predict where everybody would be sitting. <laughs> there you go. Yep, I have lots and lots of stuff. All right, so when you're done, let me know. push down on it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply pressure to the top. So right, the first one is right to the middle on the actual toothpick, okay? And what I want you to do is observe what's actually happening to the shape, okay? So don't hold it too, don't hold it too tight at the bottom or else it might not do it, but do you see how the square is starting to twist? So in architecture we call that torque. It's basically a spinning motion, okay? It's always very funny when I go into like middle school classrooms and I'm like, yeah, it's torquing. And they're like, what, it's torquing. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. um, okay, so if we could envision ourselves, okay, as walking across that top thing, and if underneath us was starting to spin, is that a comfortable situation for you? Probably not. <laughs> All right, so let's put our square back to its original squareness. Okay, and again, now we're gonna apply pressure to a different point. We're gonna apply the pressure to the marshmallow in the, in the corner. So to basically just push down. And you'll see that in this case, now the square is deforming. So it's becoming a parallelogram, true? Is everybody's doing that? Okay. <laughs> All right, so what do we know from this? Squares are not good in construction. They stink, okay? Unless you build them with steel and they're really, really strong like a steel frame, however, um, steel is actually a very recent invention, and if we think about all of the architecture in the world, um, most of it probably isn't steel. <laughs> all right, so now we're going to build our friend the triangle. So the triangle should look like this, or what's on the screen. So basically, anything that is um, that doesn't maintain its shape is seen as very weak in architecture, unless we, for on purpose, don't want it to maintain its shape. For example, in areas that are very, um, uh, earthquakes are very common, we want the building to actually be able to move with the ground. If the building is too rigid and the ground starts moving around it, the building is gonna collapse. If it actually moves with it, um, you could envision if, you're, if you yourself are on, standing on a scooter, and you're really, you have stiff legs and it starts moving underneath you, you're just gonna fall over. If you have soft legs, you have a better chance of staying on that scooter, right? It's the same idea. Um, however, again, we're just being very simple about this. So now we have our triangles made, right? And we're gonna do the same thing. So you're gonna hold it in your hands. We're gonna apply pressure to the top. Perfect, and what's happening this time? Is anything happening? No, it's staying a triangle, right? It might be squishing a little just because um, marshmallows and toothpicks aren't the strongest construction technique, but it's staying a triangle. And that's really, really important. This is the, pretty much the basis of all structures right here, is that the fact that a triangle maintains its shape. Now, if we really wanted to get into, into the math part of this, there's a reason mathematically that a triangle is so strong. It's because it has all equal um, you know, this is equilateral triangles. It has equal distances of all of its, um, okay, all of its toothpicks are equal, and then, <laughs> and then all of the angles within are all equal. So basically, everything just zeroes itself out. It just is neutralized. And if we want to look at it visually, 
all the forces, and that member, that force is you pushing down, is being distributed evenly throughout. And the goal is that it gets down to the ground to combat, um, to combat the gravity of pushing down. And the ground pushing up on it as well. All right, so are you convinced the triangles are strong? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about, which we've already talked about that, um, is bridges. So if any bridge that you go over, pretty much, is made up of a series of triangles. So this is the Grand Island Bridge, and it's so funny because, you know, we see big triangles here, okay? But even every single, um, member is made up of little triangles within it. So, you know, if we just were to count how many triangles in this bridge, it's, you know, millions, 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 millions. And that's the reason that it can stand and span the distance over the water. And then here's the Peace Bridge. Okay, so from our hypothesis, we know that we want it because we want to make a light frame, a lightweight dome. We know that the triangle is the way to go, right? All right, here's the Peace Bridge. Again, lots of triangles. Okay, so here is a geodesic dome. And um, basically a geodesic dome is a sphere shaped. Now it can be, there's this geodesic sphere, which would you know, complete the circle, right? The bottom would come to a point. Or the dome, which is cutting it in half. So when we do the marshmallows and two, we're gonna create the sphere. But when we do the full scale, we'll just do the dome. It's easier to sit on the ground. Okay, so what do we notice about this Dome. It's made up of series of, I'm going to ask you. Triangles. Great. Perfect. Triangles. Now, we're going to push it one further, okay? Can anybody see another shape in here that's defined? Pentagon? It's, yes, it's another polygon. Exactly. A pentagon. So basically, the, the basis of this dome is that a series of triangles actually creates a pentagon. A pentagon is very strong also. It's, I mean, it's just as strong, especially when it starts to be um, three-dimensional, okay? There's a little bit of height to it. And that's the basis of this dome that we're gonna be working on. Um, there, the other shape is the hexagon that's um, very strong, but mostly um, the geodesic bones are pentagons. So there it is, perfect, all right. So let's just talk about domes really quick. I'm going to show you three examples of domes. Um, this is the Pantheon in Rome, and this building was built in 126 <laughs> AD. So this is over 2,000 years old, and it is still the world's largest unreinforced dome. So does anybody know what I mean by unreinforced? No. Yeah, um, so true. Um, I, what they're referring to here is that there's no steel inside. So they could probably build a dome this big now because steel is very strong. Steel is really good in tension and concrete is really good in compression. So they work really, really well together. That's why we can build so tall now. Um, however, there's no steel in this dome. It's all concrete. It's all built in compression. It's crazy, I mean, it's insane. So they also have this um, opening at the top, it's called an oculus, and just for a sense of scale, that opening is 27 feet. So it's huge. <laughs> and actually, um, the opening makes it stronger, so it, it kind of treats it as a ring, and then everything kind of falls down from the ring. Um, the dome is actually coffered, so it looks like squares, but it acts like a triangle because they're actually dimensional. Um, so they kind of uh, retreat back into space, so they actually do act like triangles themselves. And they also, if you look at, okay. if you look um, here to here, they get larger as they come down, and that, again, is a you know, similar shape to a triangle. Um, okay, the other cool thing about this is that um, it's perfectly sphere, so it is um, let's see, 100 and, 142 feet from the floor to the top of the oculus, or to the bottom of the oculus, and it's also 142 feet wide. So it's like a perfect circle that can fit in, or perfect sphere that can fit in this. And you know that was part of the geometry of you know 
uh, they were just inventing this, you know, these math equations back then. So this is like super impressive. <laughs> it's still impressive today. All right. So the next dome is the Florence Cathedral. This is in Florence, Italy. And this was in 1423. So this building is really interesting because um, it took like two, over 200 years to actually complete. <laughs> So it started with one empire and then you know, he died or he got killed and it just kept going on and on. So after a hundred years of them building the building, they still didn't even have a design for the dome. And so um, they finally chose the design and um, you know, it's this huge grand thing um, and they finally built it. Basically people kept coming to them with, with designs and they weren't big enough or they weren't grand enough. And finally after a hundred years they had the, you know, the technology or the, the knowledge to be able to do this. And it still isn't as big as the dome that was built, you know, 2000 or er, a thousand years earlier. Okay, so now we're in 1967. So this is Buckminster Fuller, which he is really the guy with the geodesic domes. He is, I'll talk about him in a second, but he was kind of a quirky guy. But in 1967, um, for, the for the World Expo in Montreal, um, he designed the world, the U.S. Pavilion. Um, it's a huge geodesic drum. So when he first designed it, and you can see in this picture, in this, um, there were acrylic panels on it, so that you know there was you couldn't see through. However, in I think 1976, there was a fire and a, a big fire, and it was when the dome was being restored, and all of the acrylic panels melted away. However, the frame stayed, so it was kind of a, a win, <laughs> because the acrylic panels were starting to look old and dingy, and you know they really didn't um, maintain well. However, the frame is beautiful. So it sat vacant for a long time after the fire. Nobody really knew what to do with like a giant sphere, and it's not like you know you can inhabit it because it's open at that point. So. Um, they put an environmental museum and research center into it, and it's you know of a series of buildings that sits within the dome. So I thought that was a. I'm glad that they didn't take it down. But I thought it was a cool reuse. All right. So Buckminster Fuller, he called himself Bucky. He called himself a series of names throughout his life. Like I said, he was very quirky. When he would travel um, across time distances, he or across time zones, he would wear like three watches and like have when he left and like where the layover was and then where he would land and he was just a kind of a weird guy. However, he was obsessed, obsessed with geodesic domes to the point where anything that was a dome, he was trying to figure out how to make it a triangle. <laughs> so he, um, he even took the world, okay, the earth, and he created what's called the Dymaxion map and it's basically his idea of how you can flatten the world. Okay. Now, I mean, it does actually work because I did it. I studied this in school. If you if, if you take that and you fold it back all together, it does create a sphere. However, it has you know um, flat flat faces, and it's not really the world, but he got pretty close. Um, he also invented what's called the um, Dymaxion car or vehicle, and you know it's like if you look at the plans for it, it's like this crazy kind of like outer space type of thing. It's it's crazy, and um, even the Dymaxion house. So he went, he really, really, really was like obsessed with this. Now what was cool about him is that he really wasn't an architect. He actually went to Harvard twice and was um, kicked out twice. <laughs> the first time um, because he failed and the second time because of disciplinary kind of stuff. So, you know, he's fairly uneducated. He, um, he fought in a war, um, you know, he was just, he just couldn't find his way. And, um, you know, he, he ended up, really loving math and really loving triangles um, and how they relate to mathematics. And so all of this that he created, so he became an architect, he built, you know, one art, the U.S.'s pavilion in the World Expo, which is like a huge um, honor for an architect, all because he was good at math. So um, you don't have to be good at math to be an architect. However, you also don't have to be good at architecture to be an architect. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to just start by building, do you have any questions about any of that? We can talk about it as we build. Okay, so we're going to start by building this. 
So let me turn this on. Okay. All right, so I'll walk you through it and because it's a little complicated, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna build it small scale and then we're gonna work on it large scale in the back. So we'll have to kind of remember these steps as we go. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're going to make like um, a marshmallow guy. So he'll have like a belly and then like give him um, a neck and a head and some arms and hands and feet and legs. <laughs> so it'll be like kind of a star. Yeah. Only 10 minutes left in the whole thing? Oh geez. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? I rolled all that newspaper last night? I was going to make you do it anyway and stay after. <laughs> all right. So does everybody have their... Okay, so if you already have that, what you can do is the next step is pretty easy. You're just going to connect all of his, you know, his hands, his feet, and his head. You're going to connect them with marshmallow or with toothpicks. So it will look like this. We'll look at your pentagon. And what's going to happen is you'll, it will pop up on the last one. Yeah, make one. <laughs> you got it? Perfect. You got it. It will pop up on that one. Oh, okay. The middle one. Yep, so it's here. Oh. Yeah. So we don't, okay. yeah, we don't want it to be flat anymore because we're going to build the dome. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, so this next part is a little complicated and it's kind of easy to get lost in it, but if you always just go back to your triangle, I, I have faith that everybody can do it. So right now, if you look at it, it will you'll see five triangles, right? Everybody sees that? Okay, what you need to do is you need to make for every triangle, you need to kind of complete the diamond, if that makes sense. So, like this. Okay, so see how I completed the diamond? Make sense? Okay, so you're gonna do that for each of them. <laughs> Perfect. And you just, one more at the bottom. So you'll have five of these also. It should look like a star once you have all those. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're just going one step. Okay, because I think, okay, here's the Okay, so take this out. Okay, don't do that yet. Yeah, oh. you have to do this part first, and then you can connect them all together, because what's going to happen is you're going to get confused on where the top is. So I think you're at that point. <laughs> so here, here's your top part. Yep, so if we look at this part. So there is your first thing. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so you have one diamond, two, three, three, four. Okay, so you just need two more there. Okay, yep. Okay, so once you have that, you can take, there's five marshmallows, kind of like, that are points of the star, and you can um, connect those together. So now you'll see that you have a flat bottom, unlike Kim Kardashian. Uh, <laughs> that was a good one. See what she did. I saw that one. <laughs>
the flat bottom. It should be another pentagram. Is that Yep, that's perfect. Right. So then you're going to connect these. Okay. Yep. So we'll look like that at the bottom again. Oops. Perfect. Is that, are you good? Yeah. So then, <laughs> once you have that, you'll if you flip it over, you'll have the pentagon shape again. You're just going to put one toothpick in each of the marshmallows and then connect them at the top. So it's basically that little guy again. So one cool thing about Buckminster Fuller is that he actually invented a patent for a geodesic dome, and it was a certain pattern that had, um, you know, 20 flat faces and however many um, vertice vertices. Uh, it was, and he did all of the math equation behind it, and so that's how he got the patent because somebody else had already discovered it but had never really done like the background and the paperwork to get it to get his name on it. So. Um, you know, he spent most of his earlier early career making sure that no one else could do this, which was, I think, um, very um, indicative of his personality. <laughs> All right, so you should have a dome at this point. Good. Everybody's good. Did it work? You look confused. Oh, I think it's alright. I think it's good. Yeah. Oh, it's mine's a little wonky. Oh no, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> awesome. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to take out my last, um, I'm going to take this out because when we, we're going to go back in the back and do the full scale one. So this is actually what we're going to be building in the back, okay? So it will be what we just built minus the bottom. Make sense? Okay, now like I said, I've never done this and we have lots of tape and um, staples and everything else and the newspapers are rolled all ready to go so let's try it and I actually have enough for two so we can break up the teams I would bring this with you because we're going to have to visualize it <laughs> will actually be staples. So um, if we look at the rolls, the way that they're rolled, they're very dense in the middle, but at the ends they're light. So that's good for the staples because we're gonna, we don't really need to staple them in there. Um, if it's not working with just staples, we can start to wrap it in tape. And this is more of an experiment thing. So remember when we talked about the, the, the hypothesis, the hypothesis is how can we do this as light frame as possible? So obviously we, we want to at least just start with staples. If it doesn't work with staples, then we know, okay, why is it working, why is it not working? Let's go back and use tape. You know, if we need to add more reinforcement, then it just gets layered and layered on. But the goal is to build the lightest as possible. Sounds good? Yes. Okay, go. <laughs> go. <laughs> we can just have three and three, which would be the coolest. Yep. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 All the speeders support. Are these just uh, examples or can we use Okay, them? you can use them if you want to start. Um, I'm just going to warn you, they're not rolled that tight, so I would not use them because they're not as strong. You can feel it. So they're just kind of an example of how you would want to maybe staple it or if you want to use it again. Now one thing is, if you just make a bunch of triangles, it's not gonna, you're not going to have enough roll. Unless you want to do it that way, you're going to have to roll more. But because you'll be doubling them up when you put them together, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's okay. So, like, see how this triangle, this triangle, and this triangle, they share that guy. They share him. So if you made that triangle and you made this triangle, they wouldn't share him. That would be two. Yeah. Or I don't know. Keep stapling until that. So what do you mean? How does it Okay. So you want to add that crusty? They did go a little floppy. They go a little higher. Is that how they go? No, absolutely not. No, no breaking. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay. So I was afraid to get your fingers. Oh, okay. Part of it. <laughs> right, I, I, into the built into it. Right, right here. This one. You also have to pick a team member that's the going to go into that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's getting floppy. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So if we were going to contact you from the school, do we contact you okay. or are you? No, actually that has nothing to do with me. Oh, okay. But, um, <laughs> we need to go for two. 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 For each of them, lay it out first. Does that mean with that help? Thanks. Yeah, it's the same idea. Yeah. yeah. 
That's actually a good point. See, there's another science connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just like pull it off too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I never thought about that way, actually. Ta-da! Oh, oh, yeah. 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 We don't, my group specifically doesn't work, work a lot with high schoolers. Just because if we, we want to like focus on stuff. Who's getting in? <laughs> <laughs> Again, do you guys mind if I send these to Nancy for her to Okay. <laughs> so do you want to try to make it a sphere since we have a little bit of time? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll need your bowls. So we just need five more bowls. And I can show you how to hold them if you want to do this with your um, kids or your class. So you need a spread. That's one thing I learned. You can't use the single sheets. And um, you want to start rolling in the corner, and that's how you get the middle dense and then the ends um, more light. So basically, you just roll it up. And as you roll, you need to move your fingers out to the sides or else it gets wide like those. And the tighter the roll, the stronger it is. So if they're not tight, you're going to start to see some sagging in the middle, and that's you're going to have destruction. <laughs> And then I just got sheets in the middle. We have some land out in the country and we're um we're in year two of creating a willow dome. Oh, Have you ever okay. seen those? No, what is, well, maybe well you what? just plant little willow branches, and then over the year wow. after year, you just kind of sculpt them and weave them together. That's awesome. It's, cool, yeah. it's coming together. It's, it's not quite as big as I thought it would be at this point. <laughs> you know, speaking of, no, So, one, I, I, this is um, more, you know, in contemporary architecture. Um, because they're so lightweight, these are really cheap to actually build homes out of. So, um, I mean, you know, it's kind of funny, like, on Facebook, they'll say, this house was built for $1,000 yeah. or whatever, <laughs> and it's always a dome. Because <laughs> you can build them so cheap, and then basically you just fill in, you know, fill in the triangles with some sort of sheathing, you know, plywood, or if it's insulated, you know, you put some insulation in it. But um, they're starting to kind of, like, pop up in rural areas just because, you know, people use them for storage, or they use them for a workshop. So, um, like, as I, my family lives in Niagara County, so every time I drive up there, I'm like, oh my god, another dude has a dome house. Yeah. Even when we really don't need it, because we're always, you know, we have so many buildings, we still crave it within our buildings. Yeah. It's, it's really it's all together. Amazing. Yeah. 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 It's comforting. Wow, that's pretty fun. I'm impressed, you guys. <laughs> I'll take a group picture too for Nance. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks for thanks for your work. Okay. Yeah. 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 I woke up this morning, I'm like, oh, this is going to be awful. I'm so embarrassed. Okay, so do you want to put them together and we'll take a picture for Nancy. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.